Welcome to week eight of Exposure, my weekly series where I put out a very imperfect video as an exposure for my OCD perfectionism. And this week I am coming to you from San Francisco, the city, I think I made this joke already, but I'll do it again because I like it. The city that not only sleeps eight hours per night, but obsessively tracks it via various apps. Uh, I did that at some comedy club Saturday night. I arrived Saturday. I arrived not to do shows. Uh, the shows were sort of a last minute thing. I arrived in San Francisco to see Anna, my, well, uh, I guess, spoiler alert, I will use the word partner again. She's been my partner for a year and a half. Well, initially, <laughs> she was not my partner. And in fact, uh, early in the relationship, I was referring to her on stage as my pre-girlfriend, kind of like pre-diabetes. Like, if I don't make behavioral changes, she's going to turn into my girlfriend. And she, when she heard me say that, she actually got very uncomfortable. She said, I don't even think I'm your pre-girlfriend. And then as the relationship develops, sometimes she would joke, you know, all right, we can take off, you're my pre-pre-pre-girlfriend. All right, we can take off a couple of pre's. You're my pre-pre-girlfriend. Uh, I mean, I'm your pre-girlfriend. -pre anyway, uh, great. I'm already messing up words. Already a good exposure for my perfectionism. So, um, yeah, I came here to see Anna and... Um, you know, I've tracked this in previous weeks. I won't go into all the details, but after, yeah, a, a relationship that has consistently gotten deeper and easier over the last year and a half, not always linearly, there have been some tough spots. Uh, suddenly, a few weeks ago, she told me she wanted to take a two-week break and the entire relationship was very much in question. And that break was very challenging for me because the relationship was in question. But as I shared last week, um, she did reach out to me a little bit before the two weeks had elapsed and wanted to see me and I wanted to see her. And so here I am. But as my departure from Boston, where I was staying with my parents and sister and brother-in-law, nephews and nieces, the family home, as my departure from Boston to San Francisco drew nearer, I increasingly felt like nothing's really been resolved. We've just decided to see each other. But... There, I certainly did not have clarity on the big questions that emerged for me over the course of this almost two-week break. And the questions were, well, first of all, I was curious about what happened with, so, you know, what had catalyzed this for her is she had met a guy who, in her words, she was intrigued by his mind but not attracted to. But it really was just a... Uh, Catalyst in the sense that it made her realize, well, what she already knew, that she has doubts about me, about my OCD, though she is certainly the first one to credit me for how much better it's gotten over the year and a half we've been together. But it can still be problematic and concerns about where I'm at in my life with my career, my finances. The latter concern largely related to, you know, the fact that she knows she wants a family and she wants a partner who can chip in. And yeah, I appreciate all of these concerns. But they weren't explicitly addressed on our phone conversation. And so as I was, you know, getting to the airport, I was really feeling like, okay, what are we actually doing here? Because I'm going to get into San Francisco Saturday evening, go straight to the comedy club, do a couple of shows. I'm going to see her late at night. And if history is any guide, we're almost certainly going to have sex, but I don't want to just have sex with her. I don't want to do that if we don't really know if this relationship is moving forward and if it should move forward. It felt like the prudent thing to do would be to not see her that night, to wait the next day where we'd have hours where we could talk and see if this should continue. Because yeah, that's what really came up strongly for me is there was great relief initially when she said, yeah, I wanna, I wanna keep saying yes to this, but then there was also, okay, should we be saying yes to this? And the biggest question is the question, does she want to be in a partnership? Because she was very clear when I met her a year and a half ago that she did not want to be in a partnership. In fact, she had very recently concluded that she needed to be alone after getting out of a six-year partnership about a year and a half prior to my meeting her, but having in that intervening year and a half still dating a fair amount. And then we fell in love and, you know, it turned into this thing, but... Yeah, that question has cropped up repeatedly for her and certainly was really a lot of what came up when she met this other person was, do I, should I even be in a relationship? So 
So yeah, so facing this dilemma as I'm getting on the plane, like, should I see her tonight? Or should I wait until we can really talk and really see if we can come to not even an understanding because I understand where she's coming from with all this stuff, but yeah, a decision essentially. And really it's her decision because one thing I got clarity on during this break, as I've shared, is I was clear that, okay, I can't say for sure, is this the person I should spend my life with? You know, because my mind, I was going to say my OCD, but it's not quite OCD, but my mind likes binaries and it likes certainty. And clearly, a year and a half into a relationship, maybe some relationships have certainty. Well, that's the thing. As in this break, as I've talked to people, long-term married couples, including my mom and uh, siblings and, and friends, you know, what's come up is, I guess what I already knew intellectually, but really hearing it from other people in long-term relationships was helpful, which is there's never any ultimate certainty. I think when you have a, a track record, a longer track record that allows you to reasonably predict the a greater likelihood of things continuing along those lines, but there's never any certainty. I mean, there's never any certainty in anything, which is why OCD is such a crazy condition because you're trying to find certainty, which just does not exist in this reality, not for humans. And certainly with relationships, when you're talking about two people, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's not like twice as much uncertainty, it's exponential. Though I guess one squared is still one, right? So whatever, it's, it's uh, yeah, essentially infinite uncertainty. When two people are connecting, each with their own experience, trying to share their experience. And obviously the, the data bear this out. Look at the divorce rate and look at the very high rate of people who don't get divorced, but are contemplated constantly and are miserable. It's the biggest cliche and one of the easiest, most obvious stand, setup comedy standups. But man, relationships are hard. Of course they're hard. So, but feeling like, yeah, what I wanted was to know from her, does she want to be in a partnership now? And does she want to be in a partnership with me? Because my sense from our conversation was a lot of what she missed me a great deal. But that's not the same as saying that, yeah, I know this is what I want. And so feeling like, yeah, I shouldn't see her Saturday night. We're all almost certainly have sex. I should wait until tomorrow. But also, and I shared this with her and she was, you know, said, yeah, I, I understand that. And I respect whatever you want to do. But a close friend of mine has a great phrase. <clears throat> I don't know if it's original to him. Pussy is undefeated. And I don't want to reduce this to just that, but the fact that I had not seen Anna actually in a month because her desire for this two week break came at a time when we already hadn't seen each other for a couple of weeks due to logistics. And the idea that I was going to be in the city she was in after not seeing her for a month and not see her that night. And I suppose we could have said, we'll see each other, but not have sex, but that didn't feel realistic. And so I did my shows Saturday and then I saw her and, but we didn't fall into bed immediately. I was like, let's talk at least for a little bit. And we talked for long enough to confirm the thing that I was pretty sure was going to be true, that these weren't going to be easy, quick conversations, but the clock is literally ticking. It's midnight. I'm jet lagged. It's 1 AM. I'm really jet lagged. And at a certain point, it was just like, we're not going to make more progress on this now. And we did what we did and it was nice, pleasant having sex with her. But what really was blissful was the postcoital slumber. I slept deeply and very peacefully. And even in sleep, there was this awareness of her body breathing next to me, the warmth coming off of her and her smell. I mean, I've been aware of her smell, but for whatever reason, her smell was, there was just something, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? There's actually a Greek word, um, intoxicating, but it's a specific, just incredibly comforting, soothing. And I slept very deeply, but I woke up quite early. I think largely jet lag, but I think part of it was I woke anxious. I woke next to this woman who I love 
but with the very real awareness that this could be the last time we do this because we have to have this hard conversation. Um, And we did that day and it was hard. I had a basically a, a laundry list of my concerns. What happened with this guy? That was actually a very minor one. Um, and the answer there was nothing happened. But the answer was she really enjoyed. It, sh- it should be said he's Greek. And one thing she's expressed to me many times is the desire to have more Greek people in her life. And I think that's part of it. He also has a deep interest and knowledge of philosophy, which is on his probably second greatest passion after music. And, but yeah, nothing happened between them. And, but, you know, hearing that she did want to continue seeing him and she couldn't say point blank and I wouldn't want her to not point blank. That's not the right. She couldn't say unequivocally like, oh, there's no chance I would ever want anything with this person. She was clear. I'm not attracted to him. But she's also clear that for her, you know, attraction comes from really connecting with someone's mind and that can take time. So that wasn't settled, but the things, but then that just sort of paved the way to the bigger questions. Does she want to be in a partnership and does she want to be in a partnership with me? And that's when things got really painful because she didn't have any clear cut answers to those questions. The partnership thing, it continually comes up for her, this sense that she should try being alone for an extended period. She doesn't even know how long, but... And one reason she reached out to me before the prescribed two weeks she'd asked for is up is because she missed me so much. But she also felt it was very valuable being alone because a lot of intense stuff was coming up in that loneliness that would not have come up if, you know, we were in communication, if I was actively in her life at that time. And does she want to be with me? Yeah, I get her concerns. I get her concerns, but also part of me is like, so let's deal with them both in turn. The OCD, which again, full-blown OCD, rare for me, but small obsessions, not that rare. Anna and I are going for a hike and I get kind of anxious, like should we go on this hike or that hike? Um, sometimes it's happened rarely. We'll start on a hike and I'll be like, no, let's go back and go on this hike. That hasn't happened in a while. And I mentioned it hasn't happened in a while because the trajectory of my OCD has been, well, it's been steady improvement since I really started my recovery in 2009, but it's been accelerated improvement over the year and a half I've been with her. And that is not coincidental. Having another person in my life, this depth of relationship is a wonderful mirror. I see how the OCD affects her. It gives me an incentive to reduce it because I don't want it to affect her. I don't want it to hurt her. I don't want it to hurt our relationship. And it also just gives me an awareness of it because honestly, a lot of this low level OCD, well, I think that phrase itself is telling low level. That's how I perceive it. But it's not so low level. It has an effect on her and it has an effect on me because the thing about OCD, if you really want recovery, if you really want freedom, it's sort of like you need a zero tolerance policy with it. Allowing just a little bit, because the way I, I want to have, it's sort of like I can have OCD about my OCD or like I want kind of the right amount of OCD because OCD, there are payoffs, there are benefits in the short term. When I feel like I've gotten it right, there's a hit and part of me doesn't want to give that up. So I want to give up the really, you know, grotesque, intense OCD where it's agonizing and I largely have given that up. But the, what I view as low level OCD is like really my addiction to optimization is how I think of it. Yeah. A part of me has not given that up because I haven't wanted to give it up, but I do pay a price for it because if you let OCD in the door a little bit, it's never just going to stay in a little bit. And the fact is, yeah, the big OCD crises are rare, but they do happen. They don't take over for days the way they used to, but I can have an unpleasant day. And unpleasant maybe sells it short. It's not, it doesn't dominate, but you know, it can, it takes a toll. And it also takes a toll, I think, of my self-respect. Not that I judge myself for having OCD, but sometimes I feel like, 
yeah, I, I want to choose more recovery. Because as I get older, I'm more and more aware of how little time we're here for. And also, whenever I let go, whenever I surrender, invariably, things are okay. And I believe that by letting go more and surrendering more, I'm allowing the flow of life to come through me more. I'm allowing myself to be of greater service to others and whatever gifts I have in whatever time I have left here. Excessive holding on and control. Yeah, there's just this sense. It's hard to articulate, but there's a sense that it limits me and it's not the choice I want to make. So, um... Yeah, this addiction to optimization, it affects Anna. It gives her concerns. So when we had this conversation, that is still a concern. Oh, right, this was the point I was trying to make, though, is it has gotten better. So there was a part of me as we were talking, which was like, okay, I get this stuff can be problematic, but there's been consistent improvement. Like if you extend the trajectory if you you know if you plot the coordinates going forward it's it the trend is positive like why now and her secondary concern about my career and financial stuff there's also been improvement there albeit well honestly what i'd say an, an element of the improvement has been this and clearly I don't mean this in the sense that this is going viral, but I mean the fact that I am doing this exposure every week, that I am putting stuff out there, because I think that's the single biggest thing that has limited my career, is I've put very little, I hate the word content, very little of my art and of myself out there because of the perfectionism, hence this project, and hence this video, which feels particularly imperfect to me with all these digressions. So I understand her concerns about me. Even though I feel like, why are those concerns more acute now? It seems like they should be getting less acute. But I think really what it comes down to is, yeah, she knows that, you know, time is short for everyone. And it's, I think it's feeling to her like it's kind of like, okay, is this going to work out? Is Adam going to be my partner for life? She wants a family. So the point is, you know it's not going well when you have to say the point is to try to bring everything home. I won't even say this isn't going well. Again, if it's not going well, it's a good exposure. Um, the point is, she didn't have clear-cut answers as to whether she wanted to be in a partnership or whether she... Well, she did say she wants to be with me. She knows she wants to be with me, but there is this sense that maybe she does need to be alone, and there's a very clearly a sense of her concerns about, about me. And suddenly, as this is becoming clear, it feels to me like, yeah, this probably should end right now. Because I am clear. I know I want a partnership. And I know, even though doubts do come up from time to time with me, I do know I want a partnership with her. And I mean, what I really know, as I said, is I know I want to say yes to this now. I want to keep saying yes to this now. But yeah, I, I know I want a partnership. It felt like that was really the, the crux of potentially why this shouldn't continue is I know I want a partnership and she does not know if she wants a partnership. And at this point she's crying and saying, you know, I guess maybe I just have to let you go then. I love you so much, but it's not fair to you. And also this guy, the thing about this guy where I'm like, okay, and it feels like you're open maybe to meeting other people and I'm not. And she wasn't sure if she didn't fully agree with that, but just the whole, yeah, really what it came down to was I know I want this. And she knows she wants this now, but there are these bigger concerns. And I just felt this anguish, like, yeah, this, this should end now then. Otherwise, I'm just going to get my heart broken to, to go deeper with this person who very well may reach the conclusion that she does not want a partnership or may reach the conclusion that she doesn't want a partnership with me. 
And then something just shifted. It was this weird thing. Like I was in so much pain and she was crying and, and I was crying. And maybe what happened was just us not wanting to feel the pain of loss that we should have felt, but I don't think it was that. What shifted for me was just a part of me was like, wait, this really doesn't change anything. The reality is, oh, this was also part of it, is she was really, she was in anguish and she was like, I could see, like she was kind of trying to figure it out in her head. Like, do I want a partnership? Should I be with Adam? And it reminded me of OCD. Not that she has OCD, but this trying to figure something out that you can't figure out. And I have my own doubts and I know I'm not going to figure this out in my head. And I said to her, you're not going to figure this out. And I felt like, yeah, this doesn't really change anything because the reality is the only way I'm going to get more clarity on this is by continuing to say yes to it. And I know for a fact that if I continue to say yes to this, there will be more growth. That growth may be purchased at the cost of deep heartbreak, but there's going to be heartbreak either way at this point. It doesn't feel to me like it's over. It doesn't feel to me like, yeah, like we've reached the end of the road. It doesn't feel like there's irreconcilable differences. It feels like there's questions. It feels like there's fears. And so, yeah, the choice is simple. Do I want to say yes to this knowing she's not sure if she wants a partnership, knowing she has these concerns about me? And I realized, yeah, I do still want to say yes to this. There was one moment of the conversation where, you know, I'm, I, would just, I was sharing with her like, hey, I don't know either. I don't know either. And it's scary for both of us. And I don't know who said it first, but one of us said first about how like it's hard to see a future here. And the other immediately agreed. On one hand, we fantasize about a future, though we've said for a while we should stop doing that. Stop talking about, you know, getting a place in Marin and moving in together and having kids. But when I, it's sometimes, it's been this way from the beginning. Like, I don't know, a part of me can't really see it. And she has that too. And I think sharing that may be, yeah, the bottom line is neither of us know what is going to happen. But neither of us want to walk away. And it doesn't feel like it's just an avoidance of pain thing. I mean, it's not. We love each other. And the last few days have been great, generally great. One thing that came up in that conversation, not for the first time, is the fact that You know, she said, everyone in my life says I shouldn't be with you. And I've known that. Her parents, not her father, but her mother, her friends in Greece. And it's not that these people don't like me. It's that, you know, they look at the age difference and the fact that Anna has shared these concerns. They look at her, this brilliant, beautiful, successful person, much younger, and are kind of like, you could do better. And, And I get it. If I were her parents, I would feel the same way. So that came up in that conversation. But then uh, a day or two later, so we had a couple of great days and I came over, I guess this was, yeah, last night, two nights ago. And she had just gotten a message, uh, a voice message on WhatsApp from someone in her life who's a mentor, um, an older person who, yeah, I'll just call him a mentor. Someone she really respects and appreciates and who has taken a great interest in, in her, as many people do. I mean, she's a very magnetic, powerful, impressive person who really seduces people. No, seduces implies she's doing something. People just kind of, you know, are, are, are sed- mag- they fall in love with her in a way. Um, I don't mean sexually, romantically, though certainly that happens a lot too. But anyway, the case of this mentor, this older person who, you know, has no vested, no, no ulterior motives, I don't believe, just really has great respect and appreciation for Anna. And they're working together on some, you know, projects, but she's shared her concerns. And this person out of the blue left her this message saying, you know, I really think, you know, Adam may be holding you back. And she shared this with me. 
and it really, really affected me. And I just closed up. Like I just shut down. I couldn't even make eye contact. And I was just, and it was, yeah. And eventually it was like, we kind of, <clears throat> we got beyond it that night, but it stayed with me. It stayed with me in the next day. I guess it was yesterday. It was really with me in the morning. And then, well, we talked about it and she apologized for sharing it with me. I don't think there was any malintent. Though a part of me wondered if maybe she shared it with me as kind of a caveat emptor thing, you know, like, hey, just to continually warn you, like, you know, a lot of people think I shouldn't be with you. And so therefore there's maybe more of a risk that I will end this because I think in some way the, the thing we're, the thing we're, mo each of us is this, the second scariest thing for each of us is getting our heart broken. I think the scariest thing may be breaking in others' hearts, others' heart. And I think in ways both of us sometimes try to uh, sort of subtly telegraph to the other that, hey, this could end. Anyway, we talked about it and, uh, and we didn't reach any closure. It was just, she said, I mean, basically what it comes down to for her, and she said this again and again, is her mind has concerns, but her heart has no concerns. And she's choosing to listen to her heart. And as I hear myself say that, I have so much respect for it because that takes great courage. That takes great courage. And part of the reason it takes great courage is despite what whatever Disney movies would have us believe, that's not always the right answer. And she knows it, but she's choosing it. I think it's an easier choice for me to make in some ways. Maybe because I've had so much time being alone since my last heartbreak 20 years ago. But we're both making that choice. We're saying yes to this and yeah, it does feel wonderful. Yeah, I love my life here in the Bay Area with her. I love her. So um, yeah, that is where things are at this week. And uh, we'll see what happens. I guess that's all any of us can ever do. <laughs>